All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of Wing Chun ground fighting, lots of Bruce Lee at birthday parties, but not at funerals. Let's get to it. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Watch out. Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? I'm rather groovy, Sifu. How are you? I'm doing good, man. You know, we had a pretty awesome night last we night. We had a... I'm, I'm a little tired. You? Yeah, I'm a little Slow. tired. Yeah, I had to get up early to teach yeah. you, which is always a f***ing drag. <laughs> okay, you know, swear box so hey. early out of the doors. I guess they're tired, Andrew's right? going to be working hard on Damn. this episode here, right? <laughs> you know, wait. We have to, like, fall back on the curses, bro. We, we met one of our biggest fans last night randomly. That's right. And he's a nine, ten year old. Yeah. So we need to we need to fall back. Yeah, you especially you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> especially you. The, the KFG knows is shout known out. To, to, to swear a little bit on yeah. the podcast. Well, shout out to Andrew. That's right. We met Andrew. Okay. Yeah. Andrew and his dad. Yeah. We were we were in really line cool. last night to meet Bolo Young yeah. of all people okay. at the Chiller in the Parsippany <laughs> Hilton in New Jersey. <laughs> right. We drove all the way like an hour out there yeah. out of the city to meet Bolo. I only drove and, 40 minutes. Yeah, while we were waiting in line. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So someone recognized that we had the whole KFG yeah. crew there. Okay. Uh, we even had the, the headless, uh, bodiless sound guy. Yeah. And they recognized him first. They recognized him yeah. first, yeah. They could tell by his voice what he looked like. Oh, right. yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, hello. Yeah. He hello there. Hello. Yes. yes. Yeah. And so, yeah, we got, it was kind of funny. It yeah. was the first time we got recognized as a crew. Like, oh, yo, man. dude, it's KFG. Yeah, yeah it, was it was awesome. Really cool. yeah, so, it was so really and, cool. And, and we, Andrew, we met with Andrew. Out. Yeah, shout out to uh, Andrew. My man with the Spider-Man sweater. That's what's up. Doing his thing. Dude, that was crazy. So, first of all, I'm not I'm not really one to go to those, like, conventions I, that and things like that. That was my first That was the first one. I had been to, like, I think the New York Comic Con once. This wasn't really a Comic Con. It was kind of like a... It was kind of like this a, was, uh, it, it was like a <laughs> graveyard of careers. <laughs> career con. Uh, yeah, career con. Right? Career First con. of all, I mean, it was totally badass to meet Bolo. Like, oh, that was crazy. He was the most oh, badass and I would drive, person. Yeah. I would drive. He was the, he yeah. was the whole draw, right, to go the, see Bolo, right? Was, and I get why Bolo would do something like that, because uh -huh. he's... He's he's not as accessible as like other dudes, yeah. and like he's very obscure, and he's very like legendary and cult like, right? Chilling. Actually, I think he lives in Los Angeles now. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to L.A. next week. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell so him. Go see I'll him again. Him, I'll send him a text. <laughs> Yeah, let's he, just drop him a message on Instagram. Yeah, he, sure uh, he'll hang out. He, oh, yeah. he, he, uh, he reposted one of my stories. I mean, yeah. I'm sure it's not him. I'm sure it's one of his handlers. But it was funny to wake up in the morning and be yeah. like, Bolo Young has shared your story. I was it's like, lit. wow, totally it's badass, lit. totally yeah. badass. Um, yeah, so that was really cool. But what was interesting is we went there just for Bolo. Yeah. And then this dude ends up going crazy buying like shirts and stuff. Yeah. I ended up buying a DVD and um, we saw a bunch of like, like celebrities and it was just it was kind of weird like to see people like some people you're like oh man dude check that out and right. then some other people like oh my god i haven't even thought of that person for 30 years like dean gain dean gain <laughs> was that <laughs> fat republican dean gain oh god wow <laughs> who else we had um, uh katherine bach from Catherine dukes of hazard daisy, daisy duke. duke was there i was like daisy what? duke you pointed it out and i was like what yeah. you know who else was there which i, I kind of geeked out a little bit Dude, Elliot from E.T. Elliot yes. from E.T. Yeah, I was like, oh my rapping. god, because like as a kid, yeah. you watch yeah. him. It's, dude, it's Elliot, and he oh. got a he got him like a like a ponytail. He's got like long yeah. hair, long and stuff hair, like that. looking all cool. dude out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh wait, 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 wait. 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 Ola Ray, Ola Ray, Ola Ray was, from was, Thriller. Yeah, the was Thriller there. video. Yes, Ola Ray, the girl that's there with that Michael was Jackson. my geek out moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, dude, that was crazy. First of all, she still looks amazing. Yeah. All right. She's probably 80. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pushing 80, 85. Probably more like 60. Dude. Yeah. I don't so? think she's, I don't think think she's so? 80. Yeah. I don't yeah. think she's 80. I know in your mind you wish yeah, she was yeah, 80. Yeah, yeah. Hey, yo. Yeah. So think about it. Think about heck? it. Think about it. Bruce Lee would be like in his 80s now. And he was 32 uh, and 73. Okay. You're so right, you're right. In, in the mid 80s, yeah, right. she was young. She was, she was young. She was probably yeah, like 18, 19 with that thriller video. Dr. Ice and Math over there. Yeah, Dr. Ice and Math. Uh, but it was, but, but yo, but it was just crazy to like see her, and it was like, first of all, she still looks great. Okay. And then like you know, she had like you can you can you know you, you can buy you pay for the signatures and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, 
like just to be like, wow, she's like this woman is like right. in one of the most legendary music videos Amazing. ever. Thriller is one yeah. of the most. I remember as a kid, I used to watch the making of Thriller. Okay. Like so, it was like an I was like an hour long. It showed all the behind the scenes, and then at the end, it showed the Thriller video, and I would just watch that again and again, like crazy. Yo, um, so it was crazy to see her. You are a big Michael Jackson. I was a huge fan. Michael Jackson as a, fan. as a youngster. Yeah. To be honest, before you got I was into, a huge into Prince, karate, right? Before I, I was a huge Prince hater because I was such a big oh, Michael Jackson fan. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was yeah. like, yeah, I was like Team Michael I didn't Jackson know that. all the way. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. So I would, when I, I play Prince now, you still like a little no, salty no, no, no. about I, it? I, I, I grew up to, uh, I mean, I still love Michael Jackson's music, right. but I grew up to appreciate Prince later. Uh, you know what I mean? Like when I started to listen to the music and go like, wow, like, like, yeah, I, yeah, like yeah. more as an adult, I was like, yeah. oh, wow. Yeah. Prince is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it was cool to see Ola Ray, but there was all sorts of weird celebrities there. Like there was the, <laughs> the, the son from the TV show Roseanne. Yeah. Yo, and her. like to see him now, and it was just yeah. like kind of funny. Same face, same face, and everything. You're like, and, and I realized if I yeah. saw that kid at yeah. like the grocery store, right. I'd be like, where do I know this kid yeah. from? Yeah, because yeah, I would yeah. never have you been think like, you oh, went yeah, to high the, school with him. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I'd be like, I'm, yeah, I would yeah. never like expect him to yeah. be that like yeah. like around there, right? Yeah, oh, man. And then there's yeah, then there's like like dudes from the Warriors and stuff like that. But it's a little weird. Like you I know, get it. Yeah. The probably the saddest moment for me was seeing the Galaxy Quest cast along the wall when they were just like no one really had it. yeah until i realized and, that that one dude was in deadpool and i'm like oh man oh, that guy was so good in deadpool okay, okay. he was the guy who recruits deadpool yeah, yeah. And, oh, and then i saw him and, and then i was, yeah and then like it was a moment he came out i was like standing next to him i wanted to say something but i just feel like such an idiot i, I did see I a doctor in deadpool <laughs> Yeah, there was a, there's a few other honorable mentions. I mean, we're going through, and I'm like, man, you know what? Christy, it, Christy Brinkley Christy was Brinkley. there. Cheech oh, Marin. Yeah. Gina yeah. Lee Nolan. <laughs> yeah, your favorite from Baywatch. Yeah. Okay. But also, you know, um, there was one, Judy Aronson, who, if you don't know, like, for me, it was Weird Science, but for the KFG, it was American, American Ninja. American Ninja, yeah. It was, oh, they were, yeah, it was the, right. the love interest from American Ninja. I was like, oh, right. shout out to yeah. her. Yes, man, she looks better now than she did back yeah, in the Yeah, yeah, she looks like, great. She looks like, great. Like, so anyway, we had a very funny night last night. And then we we hung out with our good friend Min, uh, Min. Leung, um, whom I always beg to be on the podcast. So Min, he... Um, Break it down. Min, who Min is? Min, I've known him for a few years. Mm -hmm. He's a very, like, he's one of the most gentle, kindest dudes you'll ever meet. He's an amazing he'll artist. he that ass. <laughs> he's very good at Taekwondo. Yeah. Um, he... Uh, He's an amazing artist. You saw that he actually mm. drew those pictures of those sketches of Bolo. Of Bolo, and Bruce yeah. Lee, yeah. And, and he Bruce, gave he yeah, gave he right. gave one to Bolo. He gave Bolo one yeah, of those Bolo sketches. Bolo had yeah. a smile when yeah, he saw it. It was the only time I saw you, Bolo yeah, smile. He was like, smile look often. at this sketch, and he's like, hmm. <laughs> and then he goes back to his normal face. Like, Bolo was really cool though, but yeah. he 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 doesn't like really smile a lot, no. and he doesn't say much even in Chinese. So he kind of is very Bolo like in person. Yeah. Um, yeah. But he was super cool. Such a sweetheart, man. He was so great. Yeah, he's cool. um, But yeah, Min is uh, also someone who knows a lot about Bruce Lee. Oh, And wow. I would love to have him on the podcast, but <laughs> he just refuses to be on the podcast. So you've asked him many I've asked him multiple time. times. It could be because he, he's, he's a bit soft-spoken. I think mm -hmm. he's worried about, like literally soft-spoken. I think he's worried about not being heard, but we have a world-famous exactly. crack audio team here that can crank yes. him up to 11. Hey, all right? Yeah. Word. So anyway, Min, if you're listening... Be on the podcast. Be on yes, the podcast. On Anyone the who wants Min Lang to be on the podcast, comment below so we can put some pressure on him. He's All right. amazing. All right? Absolutely. Yes. So, uh, what you got for me today, man? Oh, wow. Today. I like how he goes, oh, wow. Like He's like, wait, oh, wait. wow, right. I got to do something. Right? Wait. <laughs> podcast. Got... Mike Shang. All right. Let's go. Mike Shang in the house. Mike Shang. Hello, guys. Hello, hello. Question for KFG. I know that some WT and, and WC families practice ground fighting, adapting their WTWC principles and techniques to the ground. What is your take on applying WT to the ground and do you see similarity in BJJ that you practice? That is an awesome question. That is a banger. That is a banger question. That's why, you know, we always try to have a banger question. As See the how first I, question, I right? set it up? Perfect. Yeah, you set it up like you didn't know, but you knew you were going to ask that. You knew it was a good question. Yeah, <laughs> wow. If only people could see the behind the scenes of all of this, Dre. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Well yeah. planned out. Well Yeah, well planned out. out. Well yes, planned. yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's a great question. So I think um, I, I have talked about this a couple mm -hmm. times uh, before, but um, yeah, it's a topic that comes up so... 
uh, I think, first of all, it needs to be established what was considered ground fighting in Chinese martial arts, at least in Wing Chun, as mm. it was kind of, uh, as Sifu Leung Teng kind of views ground fighting. So when you mention ground fighting, because Sifu Leung Teng has talked about in some of his books, like Roots of Wing Chun, that there's a ground fighting aspect to Wing Chun, right? Um, but the problem is that because of MMA and because of the prevalence of things like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Sambo and all sorts of grappling styles, that there's sometimes I think that because Sifu Leung Teng doesn't really know a whole lot about um, kind of the modern day grappling styles, he uses the term ground fighting in a different context than many people might use today. So first of all, um, when and I know this from conversations I've had with mm -hmm. Sifu Leung Teng and also from photographs that he has at the Hong Kong headquarters and stuff. When he talks about when he says, OK, in Wing Chun, we have ground fighting. All right. He means in very simple terms. OK, uh, very basic ideas where you kind of use the Wing Chun concept or you apply Wing Chun in a half kneel position, for example. So. As I understood it, okay. of course, I could be wrong. This is my interpretation from what I understood from my years learning from Sifu Leung Teng and his books and everything like that. Uh, ground fighting, as far as Sifu Leung Teng goes, is stuff like, okay, you're, you're fighting with your opponent and then maybe you sweep them to the ground. You do the Wing Chun Soka, you sweep them down. And while he's on the ground, you kneel on him and maybe give him one punch or a few chain punches, all right? When you are kneeling on him, and giving them a few punches for Sifu Leung Teng, that's ground fighting. Okay. okay, so you're like kind of more almost like neon belly ba ground uh, and pounds, ground and yeah, pound. that kind yeah. of thing, right? He would say that's ground fighting. All right, um, Sifu Leung Teng also teaches something that you'll actually see in a lot of judo and jujitsu schools, and Boss Rutan also teaches it in his uh, in his DVD uh, MMA DVD series. Like sometimes when someone surges in with a takedown and you're not able to frame or stop them either with strikes or framing or sprawling or whatever, and the person manages to kind of get you by the waist and kind of powers through you, you basically land on your back and do a back roll and roll the person off of you, right? And, and that's something that you can do if someone really surges in and does a certain type of takedown, okay. right? If someone, if someone does a more sophisticated, let's say, single leg takedown, um, where they're not they're just like steamrolling through you, but they're kind of putting you down more surgically. I, I kind it's of hard. have a confession. Yes. I, uh, I did that to Rob one time. Oh, yeah? And, and, and he, he, he tried to tackle me in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the moon. Gauntlet? The moon, the uh -huh. moon gate. Uh -huh. And we broke the curtain. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, we fixed it. But, <laughs> but to do, you know, I flipped him out. He flew in the air, but the curtain broke down. And I was like, oh, shit, man. You, so you the do stuff that, that goes on here when I'm not around, man. I'm going to have to reinstall those cameras. I, I do Keep like, an eye on my school all the I do time. Like where you're like making this confession, hoping that in front of people will somehow negate the beating yeah. you're going to get. Off yeah, I'm still going to beat the hell out of you. <laughs> I love that curtain. No, all right. I knew that I, one day I came and that thing was, was all bent to yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I know, you he, son of a bitch. He didn't have to try to tackle me like that. Though. Right, oh, right, right, right. It was his fault. Yeah, it was his fault. fault. Yo, I was just defending yeah, myself. Right? That's a typical police on, answer. Man. Yo, I was just defending myself. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Stop. Cops now. All right. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, under certain circumstances, you know, if someone really surges in with kind of, I'm not going to say a sophisticated takedown, more like a frat boy tackle, yeah. and you fall on your back, you can basically roll them off. It's like an old style wrestling catch As move I know or whatever. Firsthand, yeah. yeah, and I mean, it, it, it's actually, it actually does work in certain contexts. Oh, it Obviously, works. <laughs> if, you have, if you have someone who gives you a more sophisticated takedown where they're controlling the momentum or they change the direction, all right, that stuff's going to be a little harder. But that's something that Sifu Leung Ting would teach. He even put that in his dynamic wing. Chun book. Mm -hmm. And for him, that's nothing more than uh, an extension of the idea of giving way to your opponent's force, borrowing power, say like all these kind of things, say right? Like. Or oh, say like borrow power, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's like, so he'll have like a back roll if you get tackled down. He'll have like a, a you know, you're kneeling on your opponent while giving them a chain punch or, or giving them a single punch. Um, sometimes he even does stuff like if the guy's holding on to you, he'll do things like uh, that some catch wrestlers do which is like a can opener like where you basically do a double neck pull and crank the person like this here mm -hmm. like to get out of some weird holds right um but beyond that all right uh you know 
given someone an elbow on the ground or something like that, or a punch on the ground or a kick on the ground or rolling when you've been, you know, tackled or something that, that really is the extension of, or the extent I should say of what the Chinese, at least in the Lengting Association consider ground fighting. Of course, we have our sit fall when we fall down, you know, up kick, you're on the ground, the guy's standing, you try to kick, create space, you try to stand up. All of that stuff, you would call that ground fighting. All okay. right. Now, in, in kind of the Western world, when we think of ground fighting, we think a little bit more like wrestling and holds and locks and pins and submissions and things like that. We don't just think of you know, these brief moments when one person's on the ground punching another or you're rolling and then you stand back up, right? But that is kind of how Sifu Leung views ground fighting. So for him, it's an extension of Wing Chun fighting principles on the ground, you know, giving way, rolling, continuing to borrow your opponent's force the way you would do it if you were still standing up, just Got extending it. those principles to the ground. But it's by no means sophisticated in terms of like, getting out of certain holds and things like that, right? Especially on the ground, all right? Wing Chun has some pretty decent stuff to get out of holds standing up, but it, it doesn't have it on the ground because quite frankly, it's not part of Wing Chun's development. I mean, like, I know that there's a whole faction of Wing Chun martial artists out there that talk about Wing Chun being a complete system and it has everything. So in in the kind of, you know, Siunam Tao Cham Kyu Biu Ji, wooden dummy weapons, chi sao, chi girk, or like when you have all this stuff together, you're a complete fighter and you don't need anything else, right? And I go, well, I mean, the term complete fighter, I think, or complete system or whatever gets thrown ab about a little too loosely sometimes, right? Because you could be someone who has a very well-rounded skill set. Let's say, just use MMA as an example. You could be good with your hands, you can have good boxing, you can have good kicks, good footwork, good wrestling, good counter wrestling, good submissions. And then you could say, well, this person is a pretty complete fighter because they can, they can fight with their hands, with their feet, use footwork, movement, all that kind of stuff. They can wrestle, they can counter wrestle, and they can put you in holds on the ground. That's pretty complete. But I don't think anyone who had that well-rounded skill set would just say, I'm a complete fighter and I'm done. Hmm. You understand what I'm saying? They would constantly try to make certain aspects of what they could do better. Or they would still see that, yeah, maybe I'm still a little bit better at my striking than I am at my grappling. Or maybe my wrestling is really good, but my submissions are not as good, right? Because it's almost like if you have different categories, striking, um, wrestling, submissions, uh, maybe striking with hands, striking with legs, right? You have four different categories. You would, you would notice that there's not an even dispersion of skills in all these things. And when I mean skills, I mean not just using them. I mean also countering them. When you talk about striking, it's not just how good you strike, but also how well you deal with strikes, all right? So it's much more multifaceted than just how well you hit a bag or you hit mitts. What do you do when someone is coming at you with strikes, right? So if you look at a well-rounded fighter, I think they would be hard-pressed to say, yeah, I, I, I know a complete system of martial arts and I'm done. But you get this in traditional martial arts, where even mm. if, let's say, Wing Chun, as is, had a solution for all the problems you would end up in, all right? So regardless of how someone struck or kicked or tried to wrestle you or whatever they did to you on the ground, let's just say for the sake of argument, that super classical, old school, traditional Wing Chun had a solution for every single one of those issues. I still think you shouldn't say I'm a complete fighter because I have a complete system. I still think you would always go, yeah, I could still be better at this. I could still be better at this. Mm -hmm. I'm not as good as this at this aspect as I am at this aspect, right? So I think the problem is that people always, they want to use these tropes like complete system. And it's all contextual for self-defense, for fighting in the ring, for fighting in MMA, for yourself, uh, for having a solution for most situations you might end up in. I mean, what a complete system means, I think it's it's kind of a bullshit term. It's something I used to say, oh, Wing Chun's a complete system. We teach you how to defend punches, kicks. If someone tries to grapple you or you end up on the ground, whatever. But as I, I hopefully kind of feel like I'm maturing in my martial arts sense, I... I don't say that anymore. I say like Wing Chun is a really great martial art for self-defense, for defending yourself on the street. And it's a really fantastic art. And it's something that we can develop further for future generations. But I think the moment you talk about a system as being complete or finished, it's dead. You have to always think about like Bruce Lee said, you're not mature, you are maturing. 
I think your, your martial arts skills, the way you view martial arts, the practice itself should always be maturing, the way you apply stuff, the way you drill stuff, right? So I know that was a little circuitous answer there, right? But, but it's, it's important <laughs> oh, to understand no. that the, the Hong Kong idea of ground fighting is not nearly as fleshed out as, say, the Western idea of what ground fighting entails, right? So in Europe, in the EWTO, even as early as the 80s, uh, because Sifu Kanspecht had a background in like catch wrestling and had done other martial arts before, um, he would even do some grappling stuff with his Wing Chun students, according to his book on single combat. Like sometimes after Wing Chun training, they would like, let's say, just wrestle for 15, 20 minutes afterwards, just to kind of develop that as a skill and also to feel comfortable with that kind of pressure that a wrestler might, might give you, right? Got it. And as a result, they also wanted to develop kind of a, what they call, at that time, it was called Anti-Bodenkampf in German, which was anti-ground fighting. Anti-Bodenkampf. Bo Bodenkampf. All right. Bodenkampf. Boden means floor, Kampf means fight. All right. Kampf. And so uh, they, they created this program, and, and what it did is it addressed certain situations in more detail. Like what if you're in a headlock on the ground, like a scarf hold, or what if someone maybe mounts you or something like that, right? And the idea was to use basic Wing Chun principles, um, which ends up looking a little bit like jujitsu stuff because jujitsu in, in, in Brazilian jujitsu or traditional jujitsu is also trying to, you know, borrow your opponent's force and stuff like that, right? So what you end up seeing is that there, there are only so many intelligent ways you can get out of being put in the mount All right. or there are only so many intelligent things you can do if someone puts you in a headlock in terms of what really works and what's just kind of traditional martial arts gibberish like oh i'm just gonna grab if someone puts me in a headlock on the ground i'm just gonna grab his nuts well good luck with that all right <laughs> because the guy who puts you in a headlock First of all, the, if you've never been in that situation before, the moment you get put in a basic headlock, and a headlock is not even considered high level in grappling. A headlock is like a basic it's hold. Instinctual. If stuff. you do a headlock in a jiu-jitsu training, you'll get your back taken every single time, right? Mm. But it could happen to you in a street fight, and if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to start getting your face pounded in, right? So the moment someone puts you in a headlock for the first time and puts you on the ground and holds you there, the last thing you're going to be thinking about is punching them in the balls. You're probably not going to be in a position to do it anyway, and you're okay. going to be worried about like, oh man, this guy's squeezing my neck, his weight is on me, I can't breathe really well. Oh crap, he's starting to punch me in the face right now. Mm. And it's not this kind of simple trope of traditional martial arts, go, oh, someone gr uh, grabs me here, I'm just going to punch him in the nuts, or I'm just going to grab him in the nuts. Or, it's always the nuts, right? <laughs> and and it's, it's, not, it's not really that easy, right? Right? And the better grapplers are go not going to be in a position where you can do that to them. And even if you do it to them, they're just going to squeeze harder and you're going to, you're going to be choked out, mm. for whatever they're doing. Right. So, but what the EWTO did is they, they started, they had like a fate, kind of a phase one development for using Wing Chun ideas in mm, uh, expand the, the term ground fighting for Wing Chun, not, not just talk about punching someone on the ground or doing a back roll when you get taken down. But having like a little bit more of a vocabulary, and Sifu Imin Bostepe, from what I understand, was one of the pioneers of that program. Wow. And he had apparently also had some background in Turkish wrestling and stuff. So I believe he was actually part of creating that program. Now, wow. when you look at it, this was something that they were doing in, I believe, the late 80s and early 90s. So this was a Wing Chun ground fighting program in Europe that predated the UFC. Okay. Got it. And um, when you look at it now, of course, it's very rudimentary, like some of the headlock defenses or some of the ways they were showing people to get out of arm locks and things like that. But they were, I mean, if you compare a lot of martial arts in the 80s and 90s to today, it's more rudimentary anyway. But they were the only Wing Chun people using quote unquote classical Wing Chun that were kind of putting their heads together to go, Using the Wing Chun concept and Wing Chun ideas, what do you do if you're put in this hold? Because this is not something Yip Man taught. Right. This is not a situation they were ending up in in 1950s Hong Kong on rooftops, all right? Um, you know, Wong Sun Leung was not dealing with someone coming in with a very quick double jab to, uh, to a double leg takedown attempt, switches it to a single leg, and then, you know goes to a high crotch and takes him down and then mounts him or puts him in a, you know, X guard or something like that. Like th these are not things <laughs> that they were dealing problems. with, right? Okay. So to think that just by virtue of doing Wing Chun or being the tough guy or being a fighter or whatever, you can just handle these things. And if you don't have experience with it, all right, you can be, able to, you can be able to defend yourself competently on the street with fists and look like a complete nothing if you went into a boxing ring. 
right? Because, it, because again, it's a different situation, right? Someone comes up to you in the street and does something and pop, 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 you have very quick uh, actions, you have very decisive uh, movements and you have powerful hands, you can defend yourself with hands on the street. That same person, you put boxing gloves on them and go, okay, I want you to go with this guy who has a couple years of boxing experience. Suddenly that guy who can defend themselves on the street looks like a rank amateur because you're now doing something different, mm -hmm. all right? And, and so it, it's kind of like a thing that like on the Hong Kong side, what, we, what was called ground fighting, super basic. So you cannot really compare it. The EWTO already started to develop some kind of stuff, but that was a European development in let's say the 80s, more so in the 90s. And then nowadays, the EWTO just straight up has grappling through uh, uh, Gokor Chivichian in, in Los Angeles, right? Mm. He's actually like, they have a grappling trainer and, and they do that like just straight up grappling now. And now that's integrated in the EWTO program. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm more like, you know, I train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with Magno and I do that to enhance how we, I teach you guys to defend stuff, improve maybe the way we defend sweeps and throws and takedowns and watch out for things on the ground. But like for my senior instructors, I, I would be okay with them, you know, bringing Magno in and actually teaching them a little bit about ground fighting and wrestling, standing up and clinch and stuff like that, just to have the experience, right? Yeah. So you can apply your Wing Chun better. Um, but traditionally, you know, the so-called Chinese ground fighting is, is not really that sophisticated. So we can always try to keep the principles the same. I mean, if you actually look at the principles of jujitsu, they're very similar to the principles of Wing Chun in terms of what, what our aims are, even if the techniques are not the same. So I think that there's a way to kind of unify the ideas without kind of diluting the Wing Chun. But I mean, the purists are always gonna think you're diluting. If you're not just doing the <laughs> forms, the classical Wing Chun and the Chi Sao or whatever, and you're doing anything else, it's diluted. That's not and the thing is that wrong. you don't see any of those really classical guys doing anything special. Some classical guys just do wrestling and other martial arts to kind of like do that stuff, but then they don't um, use any of that knowledge to enhance their Wing Chun. And then so they kind of have their cake and eat it too. They can oh. pretend to be an ultra traditional Wing Chun Sifu and just do the traditional Wing Chun stuff. But then they also go and train with wrestlers and grapplers and do all that kind of stuff um, so that they feel like they know what to do if that situation happens while on the other side of their mouth proclaiming that you only right. need classical Tradition. Wing Chun, right? So okay. I know for a fact that there are a number of those kind of Wing Chun hypocrites out there hey. that are kind of like that. Um, but, hey. uh, you know, I think Hypocrit. you should just hypocrites. All right. Like last week's episode. But that's a great question. All right. What else you got for me? Hey, Kung Fu Genius listeners. If you're a Wing Chun practitioner, especially from the WT or Learn Ting line and want to get really personalized immersion training with me, you can now apply to do an immersion course with me here in NYC or if you like the sun in my Florida home near Orlando. These courses are for instructors or anyone who's serious about learning the art in detail and working hard. I teach in program blocks like Siunam Tao, Cham Q, Buji, Wooden Dummy, and those include the Chi Sao theory, fighting applications, and training methods as well. If you're really serious about learning Wing Chun, check out the link in the description below to find out about applying for a spot. For those of you who are not quite ready to do full private immersion training, you can also apply for a spot at either our winter or summer intensive training camps. We have a few spots available for non-city Wing Chun students, so apply today. A link for those options are in the description below. And now back to me. Wow. All right. Next up. This is going to be interesting name-wise. Andrez. Andrej. Andrej Garstecki. Okay. What? Okay. I'm, I'm not going to try and um, pronounce that. I'm just going to say that you didn't pronounce it correctly. Yeah. Of course I didn't. Andrej. Andrej. How about this? A N D R Z E J. Mm -hmm. How would that go? I think you pronounce it perfectly. Go on. What's the question? <laughs> the best. Hey, KFG, do you have some cool story, including both Bruce Lee and C. Joe Leung Ting? Anjay? I don't know what Anjay means, but he threw that in at the end. I guess that means thanks. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Do I have any interesting stories about Leung Teng and Bruce Lee? Yeah. Uh, no. Damn. Um, so, uh, they never cross paths? 
Yes, they did twice, but the stories are not interesting or <laughs> funny or anything like that. Oh, no. So um, according, I asked Siva Langting once, I yeah. asked him, like, did you ever meet Bruce Lee? Mm-hmm. Now, um, to be fair, a Siva Langting, he's not a Bruce Lee fan, oh, okay? Sh- um, but that is not a, um, within the Wing Chun community, I would have to say within the Yip Man, or I should say, let me streamline it even further, within the Hong Kong Yip Man Wing Chun community, all right? Wow. Bruce Lee is a, um, it, it, it's not, it's not the, the I don't, well, I'm, why am I even trying to be political about this? Who gives a shit? Yeah. Some people really love Bruce Lee and some people really hate Bruce Lee, okay? What? Yeah, within the Hong Kong Wing Chun Yip Man community. Okay. Why? Because some people view Bruce Lee as like a hero of the Wing Chun system, right? Mm-hmm. Because he, because of Bruce Lee, he put Wing, Wing Chun, Chun on a map. Yeah, he got eyes on Wing Chun, right? And I think that everybody who does Wing Chun, especially in the Yip Man lineage, needs to recognize that. Because if you just spew a bunch of Bruce Lee haterade about him not learning the whole system or whatever... I'm so, eat a bag of dicks, dude. Shut up, okay? <laughs> I mean, like, because if it wasn't for Bruce Lee, yeah. all right, you probably would not be doing your awesome super classical Wing Chun where you can stand there on your soapbox and pretend to criticize someone who's the reason why you ha- your entire martial existence uh, exists, mm-hmm. okay? So, but you have a faction that doesn't like Bruce Lee mm-hmm. because, in my opinion, it's just jealousy. Because they go, oh, Bruce Lee didn't learn the whole Wing Chun system, all right? And they use that as a point to attack him and also defend the fact that they did learn the whole Wing Chun system. And I go, like, but that's a ridiculous way to attack someone. You know why? Yeah. So they're like, okay, let's say Bruce Lee learned three years of Wing Chun, or let's say he only learned a year and a half. All right. Okay? Let's, let's give the haters what they want. Oh, he only learned Wing Chun for a year and a half. And not, and not from Yip Man, really just from Wong, just from Wong Sun Lung. Oh, like as man. if that's some kind of diss, right? Okay, so let me get this straight. Your, your big talking point about why you don't like Bruce Lee is he's a dude who only learned a year and a half of Wing Chun, not even directly much from his Sivu, just from his Si Heng. And he still went out to be the most famous Kung Fu person in the world. How is that a diss? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Can you imagine? Oh, that guy's no good because he only learned a tiny piece of our style and not even from the master and still became super famous. Uh, I'm missing the part where you're dissing him. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He, he didn't learn your whole special system. Yeah. He didn't learn everything. He yes. only learned some of it. And yes. he didn't even learn it from your main guy. And he went out and blew everyone's socks and off. And he'll still beat that ass. Yes. And that is what you're attacking him on. Mm. Meanwhile, you learn the entire classical Wing Chun system. And no one gives a shit about you. <laughs> all right? And you're Man. not nearly as skilled as Bruce Lee. You're not built like him. You don't have the charisma, the skill set, and even with your classical Wing Chun, I think you couldn't fight your way out of a wet paper bag with scissors in your hands, all right? And you're attacking Bruce Lee, all right? Eat a bag of dicks, okay? I'm sorry, all right? When the, when the Hong Kong Wing Chun community takes aim at Bruce Lee, I just, I, 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 I mean, look, you don't have to be like, oh, Bruce Lee was the best and Bruce Lee, all that kind of stuff. But it's like, Bruce Lee's the reason why anyone gives a shit about anything that comes out of your Give mouth. Give credit where credit is yeah. due. Any Wing Chun Sifu in Hong Kong that has a pulpit, that has students, the only reason anyone gives a shit is because of Bruce Lee. So when I hear these Wing Chun guys in Hong Kong starting to like attack Bruce Lee for, for what? Only learning a little bit of their style and mm-hmm. still becoming famous? Yeah. That's a huge testament, not just to Bruce Lee, but also to Wing Chun. How are you dissing someone? Mm-hmm. All right? Can you imagine? It's like, oh man, I had a student here. He only learned from me for three months, but he ended up being one of the most famous martial artists in the world. All right? And then all my okay. seniors say, yeah, that asshole only learned for three months. Uh, yeah, but what did he do with the stuff he learned for three months, right? When these guys start throwing that haterade, I just I start looking in my pockets. Mm-hmm. And I go, do you hear this? <laughs> all right? I mean, right. shut up. All right, you yeah. don't have to be a huge Bruce Lee fan. You don't have to be care about all this stuff about him, but you need to shut the hell up with that nonsense, right? So the thing is that um, you have a faction of Bruce Lee uh, of Hong Kong Wing Chun people that don't like Bruce Lee because, in my opinion, they're jealous of him. All right, and also I think that they feel the fact that Bruce Lee created Jeet Kune Do and then had criticisms of Wing Chun 
I think that some of the very traditional Wing Chun guys feel that that's an affront to their existence. Mm. Because mm. it's like, how dare this upstart with only one and a half years or two years or three years or whatever they want to give him, criticize an art he didn't even learn completely. And the thing is that, and then what they want to do is they want to attack the messenger. But the thing is, Bruce Lee could have known almost no Wing Chun. But his assessments about Wing Chun could still be correct nonetheless. The, the thing is wow. that people always want to attack the messenger. Wow. You understand what I'm saying? Like, look, if you say wow. something that I don't like, well, if the thing you which say- Which happens all the time. Which happens all the time. <laughs> the only difference is most of what you say is not true. Okay. But let's pretend you say something that's true or factual or wow. a piece of wisdom. And it bothers me. Mm. Okay? Then what do most people do? They go resort to the ad hominem attack. They attack the person who said it so that they can avoid having an argument about what the person actually said, which is not what they want to talk about. Ad hominem. Yeah, which means to attack the person. All right, it's a logical fallacy. It's actually an, an incorrect way to, to argue a point because it's not arguing the point. Jeez. It's I'm going to attack you so I don't have to argue your point. All right, if I, can, if I can make it look like you're a hack that doesn't know anything, then I can avoid the discussion altogether. Yeah. All right, so for example, if, if Bruce Lee said something about Wing Chun like, uh, Wing Chun only has a stray punch, and it, in his notes he says it lacks variety. Mm. Okay, and then what is the very typical Wing Chun response to that? Well, that's because Bruce Lee didn't learn all Wing Chun. He didn't learn that in the Buji form we have this type of punch and in Chumki we do this. And later you learn all these different things and you can apply the knife with empty hand and that changes the angles and all this. Da, 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 right? They kind of say that very reflexively. And then, but the whole real thing is that he didn't learn the whole system so he doesn't know. Meanwhile, look at many Wing Chun Sifus who did learn the whole system and you will see that their striking lacks variety. Mm. Okay, so it's like, okay, well, let's look at the guys from the different lineages who learn the knives and the pole and the dummy and all that stuff and watch them, all right? Their striking lacks variety. Now, most Wing Chun people will say, well, because they're only doing what they need. Wing Chun's about simple actions. I go, yeah, but they're also mostly doing it against their students who only know what they were taught. When you put that person in a pressure cooker of having to deal with someone who knows everything they know or more, they're going to need to be able to apply their Wing Chun much more creatively than they do it against their own students. Wow. Okay? But yeah, let's just talk about what Bruce Lee didn't learn. All right? Even though it's a very clear observation that most Wing Chun Sifu who learn the whole system do lack in a variety of... I shouldn't say a variety of striking, like they need to add different strikes. They don't even use most of their Wing Chun flexibly. They just, they, you look at most of these sifus on Instagram and the Poon Sao, and then it's one, two, three, combination attack. One, two, three, combination attack. Combo one, combo mm -hmm. one, combo two. And they're not doing it because they feel something. They're running scripts. Jesus. All right? And even if you had 10 combos out of Poon Sao, that's 10 combos. That's, that's not an adaptation. And then you look at all the stuff that Bruce Lee was talking about, about, you know, man, the living creature has to, he cannot be a product of the style and the thousands of years of propaganda, but needs to become, you know, a living, breathing martial artist and human being, right? Mm -hmm. And these are the things that piss off traditional martial artists because they're like, no, you have to follow the style and learn the whole style, which I believe is true. You should finish learning a style before you start improving it. But um, they take aim with that stuff because they feel like um, it's an affront to their existence. Wow. All right. And then they don't want to address it. So half of the Hong Kong Wing Chun guys just want to blast Bruce Lee because they don't want to actually face difficult questions about the nature of traditional martial arts and the way that they practice it. All right. So you have that. So what does that have to do with the question you asked me? Bruce Lang Tang is a bit of a Bruce Lee hater. He's a bit in that category, <laughs> all right? Um, and well, I've had, come, I mean, I'm a huge, you know, it's kind of weird. Like, I kind of had to kind of be a closeted Bruce Lee fan for most of my time during the IWTA. Wow. All right? Uh, like, like now when you come to City Wing Chun, you see a bunch of photos of Bruce Lee on yeah. the wall and uh, posters. and So with this Yip wasn't Man. here. No, you would only see Yip Man, Lang Tang, IWTA stuff, right? I remember one time I had a, like, some 
small picture of Bruce Lee or something <laughs> like that. And Tifa Langton came in and he was he was like, why he do you have that? It? He, he was almost unhappy about it. I could tell. He didn't tell me to take it down, but I could tell that it like, irritated him. Oh, shit. And then so that's why if you look at my school, if you look at photos during my time during the IWTA, you will only see Yip Man, you would only see Leung Tang stuff and, and things like that. But he would also get pissed off by too many photos of my Sifu instead of like him. You know what I mean? Oh, okay. So, 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 I mean, to be fair, it's not just about great. Bruce Lee or something like that. But, you know, what's interesting. I, you know, I didn't even have that Donnie Yen Yip Man poster up when he was here. Right. right. But like, I'm, I guarantee you he would not be happy about that. You know what mm. I mean? Um, so to be fair, it's, it's also kind of his character, all right? But a lot of those old generation Sifus are kind of like that, right? And then some people are totally cool with Bruce Lee. And obviously people in the Wong Sun Leung lineage are probably more cool with Bruce Lee because he came from there, right? Mm -hmm. But other people are like, you know, very <laughs> Bruce Lee. <laughs> but unfortunately, Sifu Leung Tang is a bit of a Bruce Lee hater, all right? And so I asked them one time, I said... Um, do you uh did you ever meet bruce lee and he said twice but very briefly all oh, right uh the first time he said it was at a party i believe he said it was some kind of birthday party all right someone's birthday party. i don't know if it was for yip man right i don't know i don't i don't actually think so i did the yip man didn't really strike <laughs> me as someone who had a big, and well, no, went, no it, it, it no i doubt eight. that i doubt that um no it the reason why I don't think Yip Man had a big birthday party that Bruce Lee showed up is because there are no photos. Mm. So I have to imagine it was a mutual acquaintance or something like that, right? Okay. And so he, but he just said that he saw him at this party and he didn't really say anything like he talked to him or anything like that, right? No conversation. Wow. There's some stories in the internet that like a Bruce Lee showed up to the VTAA when Leung Ting was there and showed up his guys or whatever, but it, what, it wasn't Leung Ting's guys. It was someone else's guys. A very, it, it, it was a, a, a very, in the modern day, very revered student of Yip Man. Um, so, which is why I don't want to say who it was, but it wasn't Leung Ting's guys that you got like- You gotta tell the story. No, I can't. No. no, no, I can't tell the story. What? Um, and I, I think it was just that Bruce Lee came and he, he took some of the students that were there and he kind of like was, you know, doing his feints and stuff like that. And with their very traditional Wing Chun couldn't do anything. Right. Um, and then there was a speculation <laughs> that this was like, oh, those were Leung Ting. This wasn't Leung Ting's guys. Oh. I, I know exactly whose guys they were. Yeah. I'm not going to tell that. Oh, all right. Um, and it also wasn't really a big deal. It was just he kind of came and, they, came you know, kind of flicked some... a couple jabs and they yeah. were there standing like statues, like many of the traditional Wing Chun guys. Oh, like they're not moving. Think taking the Siunam Tao as a literal idea of footwork. All right. I'm just going to stand yeah. here like I'm doing the Siunam Tao. And then he's just kind of moving around them and they, they can't hang with that. Okay. So, um, yeah, so there was this one birthday party thing. And then the other one was, you know, Bruce Lee famously did not go to Yip Man's funeral, all right? And it's not entirely clear why. There, there is an inter... There is, like, a, was a question Bruce Lee was asked, and he said that, that his seniors didn't tell him, mm. like, when it was or where it was. Mm -hmm. It's possible he was working. I don't know, but Bruce Lee got blasted in the Hong Kong newspapers. Yeah. Because Yip Man died in December of 72. And this was about a year after Bruce Lee became famous. And his honeymoon period with the Hong Kong press was over. When Bruce first burst out into the scene with uh, uh, Big Boss and Fist of Fury, he was like the darling of the Hong Kong press, right? Because All he right. was a child star that went to the States and came back and became this big star again. So it was this huge story. But like everything with the press, it's always cyclical. They build you up eventually so they can start tearing you down. And in the last seven, eight months of Bruce Lee's life, which was essentially the tail end of 72 into, in, t until his death in 73, the press was starting to have a field day with him. You know, mm. they were starting to pick at him about like, you know, his affairs with Betty Ting Pei and his issues with Raymond Chow and other martial artists trying to challenge him and, uh, uh, you know, the, the feud with Run Run Shaw, all that stuff was starting to get picked up in the press and, and they were being quite unfair, right? And then, you know, even... Even Yip Chun was making up bullshit about Bruce Lee. He made up some story that uh, Bruce what? Lee got knocked down or knocked out during training or whatever. And Yip Chun did not come to Hong Kong until, uh, until the mid-60s. So what? actually, Yip Chun did not come to Hong Kong to move until Bruce Lee had already left Hong Kong for five years. So how would Yip Chun have ever seen Bruce Lee training Wing Chun? He wasn't even there at that time. And then because Bruce Lee was this big star, uh, Yip Chun was like saying like, oh yeah, actually, you know, he, he got knocked down or knocked out or something like, uh, uh, you know, in training, which first of all, also 
shows you kind of a lack of experience, in my opinion. I don't know why Yip Chun said that, all right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure his guys are going to say he was misquoted by the newspaper, and that's also possible, right? But it's also a really silly thing to say. Like, let's say you become a super famous Wing Chun master, like 10, 15 years from now, right? Sure. And then someone you trained with 10 years ago is like, oh, man, I totally, like, knocked that guy back or whatever. Oh, like, no. 10 years ago, like, oh, when man. we were students? You know what I mean? Like, mm. like I always find it weird. Like, oh man, when that guy was a student, uh, uh, he, he got knocked out in training. And I go, like 10, 15 years ago when he was still learning? Yeah. I go, it, if someone got knocked out or knocked down during training, you know what that tells me? They're doing realistic training. <laughs> okay. All right? If that guy 20 years later becomes a banger, you're still going to hold over the head, his head while he was a beginner. He got knocked down? or knocked back, that shows me that you might not be training very realistically. And I'm not saying that's particularly against Yip Chun, I'm just saying this is an attitude that's very prevalent. Oh, oh yeah, well, oh, uh, when I used to train with that guy, he wasn't so much, you know, it wasn't such a big deal 20 years ago oh, when he yeah. was still learning. Yeah, it probably wasn't a big deal because he was still learning. So I always find that's like a really weird attitude to kind of like try to attack someone while they were still learning a style before they were good and then kind of go, yeah, they weren't really good then. Yep, they're not that person anymore, right? So I don't know why Yip Chun said that, but at the time of Bruce Lee's death, he was actually suing the newspaper uh, and Yip Chun for, for saying that, right? And apparently Bruce came to Yip Chun and said, what is this? And then Yip Chun said, no, 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 it was the newspaper or whatever. And then so, so I don't know what the story is, all right? But that, but that, seemed, but that was that's mm. very indicative of Bruce Lee's relationship with the press in those last eight, nine months of his life. And when Bruce did not go to Yip Man's funeral, there was a cartoon in the press, like the next day in the newspaper. And I have a copy of it. I can show it to you. What? And it was, a, um, it was a, a single frame kind of comic. The background was Yip Man's coffin and Yip Man's photo. And then it was Bruce Lee in front of it wearing like his leather jacket, looking all like a movie star with his sunglasses. And he has his hand on his head. And it said in Chinese... Um, sorry, Sifu, I couldn't come to your funeral. I was too busy earning money. Ouch. And this was a huge blast on Bruce Lee. Ouch. All right. And then when he was later asked why he didn't go, uh, the only time I saw him mention is he said something like he called the, his seniors in Wing Chun sons of bitches mm. who didn't uh, tell him about like where the funeral was or something like that. But I don't know. I mean, because even until his dying days, he was still very close to Wong Sun Leung. Like Wong Sun Leung showed up on the set of Enter the Dragon, which would have been after Yip Man's funeral. Okay. So did Wong Sun Leung not contact Bruce Lee about Yip Man's funeral? So I don't know. It's like a really weird thing because it's not clear on either side why he went or why he wouldn't go or whether he really didn't know or how would he not be able to know given you know, but i don't really think bruce lee would have not gone to his sifu's funeral had he because known? yeah because there was always speculation that bruce and yip man basically after bruce lee coined the term jeet kun though he's more or less pruning himself off the the branch of wing chun and he's kind of like it's an affront to his sifu to create his own style and kind of put himself on top right even though that wasn't necessarily bruce lee's you know he didn't do it to become a grand master or something like that right um he did it to further explore his own martial arts but of course from the chinese perspective this was to be a bundo to be a rebel of the original style you came from mm -hmm. because it's not acceptable so uh the story was you know that it wasn't clear what the relationship between bruce lee and Yip Man was right but shortly before i think it was the last year 72 Bruce Lee went to go see Yip Man. They went to dim sum and there was a reporter there and they took some photos. And you can see uh, Yip Man is with Brandon. He's a little bit older and he's there with Bruce Lee's where it looks like a daishiki. <laughs> okay. And uh, um, the story so was... the goatee? Yeah, and the story was... No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, and the story was that um, uh, Yip, that Bruce Lee asked Yip Man, he goes, uh, do you still consider yourself my teacher? And then Yip Man... Count asked Bruce Lee, do you still consider yourself my student? And um, and and then they took then they took a photo together and then everything was kind of like patched up. According to Yip Chun, right after that, they went and walked out on Nathan Road, which I've okay. uh, which we've been on many times, right? right? Um, kind of hand in hand publicly. Uh, so as if people could see 
Yip Man and Bruce Lee together, right? Mm-hmm. Yip Chun told that story. I saw it in the documentary in Sha Tin in Hong Kong. Um, I, I have no reason not to believe him, but I'm also curious why there, were, there are no photos of Bruce Lee and Yip Man arm in arm mm. on Nathan Road, right? It, it seems like a nice story. I don't know if it's true. But from what I understood, I believe that at least publicly, Bruce and Yip Man had patched up whatever the issue was about, you know, Bruce not being Yip Man's student anymore because he created Jeet Kune Do. So I find it very hard to believe that why, why would Bruce not want to go to Yip Man's funeral? Everyone went to Yip Man's funeral. When you see the photos, unfortunately, there's no video footage of Yip Man's funeral the way there is of Bruce Lee's. Um, but when you see the photos of Yip Man's funeral, that was like a who's who of all the martial arts guys at that time. Sekin Han Sekin. from End of the Dragon yeah. was at Yip Man's funeral. Yeah. All right? So was Tam Hon, so was uh, Chan Sao Chong. Um, all of these famous Kung Fu masters, Kwan Tak Heng, all of these guys showed up. Uh, to Yip Man's funeral. So it, 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 it seems weird that Bruce would not. Mm. Okay? So I uh, have to remain agnostic about the reasons, but I will say uh, I think that there was some kind of miscommunication about the date or something like that. Bruce, okay. Bruce gave the impression that maybe people intentionally gave him some wrong information, right? Um, and so Bruce didn't go to the original funeral and so the first, so to come back to the Leung Ting question. So the first story, Leung Ting told me he said you met Bruce Lee twice. Mm-hmm. One was at some party, birthday party or whatever. And there was nothing remarkable he said about that. And the second time was at the Wing Chun Athletic Association. Um, they had a, um, usually in, in Chinese custom, uh, a certain number of days after someone dies or they had the funeral. So let's say 100 days or 90 days or something like that. They usually have some kind of um, ceremony. Mm. All right, for okay. that person, like the final ascendance or whatever, right? And they had something, they had some kind of ceremony at the Wing Chun Athletic Association. And Bruce Lee showed up to that oh, right. and then paid his respects and, uh, you know, burned some incense or something like that, right? And that's why people, uh, there's some photos of Bruce Lee when he showed up to that thing. And then people say, no, 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 see, Bruce Lee did go to the funeral. Mm. And uh, but that's that wasn't the funeral. That was like a ceremony after the fact. And I think that that was the second time Leung Teng saw Bruce Lee. But one thing that Leung Teng told me, which I thought was kind of I don't know if it's true, mm-hmm. and because uh, not that I think Leung Teng would necessarily lie about that, but I mean maybe maybe um, he just kind of uh, suggested it, or you know maybe uh, so he told me that when he was at Yip Man's funeral, mm-hmm. uh, there were a bunch of reporters there. And then he was talking to the reporter and he was like, uh, isn't, it, isn't it strange that Bruce Lee's not here? So, so Leung Ting kind of made it seem like he was the one who told the reporter that the Bruce Lee was not at the funeral. But Leung Ting did not, but, I mean, Leung Ting did not have to tell the reporter that Bruce Lee was at, not at the funeral for people to realize that Bruce Lee was not at the funeral, right? right? But, but Siva Leung Ting did say, yeah, I was talking to a reporter and I mentioned to him, you know, isn't it kind of curious that Bruce Lee is not here at the, the funeral or something like that, right? And then... Uh, and then, you know, then, of course, it was a big thing. So maybe Siva Leung Ting is in some way trying to t- take credit for the media backlash that Bruce well, Lee got. Maybe, but I don't think he, they needed Leung Ting to, to tell the reporter. Maybe the reporter said that to Leung Ting. I don't know. I mean, mm-hmm. first of all, can you, can you tell me accurately a conversation you had in 1986? Ah. Uh. You see what I mean? You, you, you can remember talking uh, to your boy back then. I was 11. Or, yeah, but you can remember like a conversation you might have had with your boy about something. Uh-huh. But can you really t- say what you said? Man. So that's why when, if it's not like written down from that time, if it's not a video and someone tells you kind of like what was said 40 years ago, 50 years ago, unless mm-hmm. it's like one of those things where it's like, I will never forget when this guy said to me, and then I said that, right? But you just talk about some casual conversation you had a rep- with a reporter. It's, the, the, it's very easy to misremember things. And, and so I, I don't know. Mm. But um, Sifu Leung Teng is not a Bruce Lee fan. Now, from what I understood, he actually knew Bruce Lee's younger brother, Robert, because oh, okay. I think they're about the same age. I think they even might have gone to school together. Um, but I cannot confirm that. But I know that he does know, um, Leung Ting does know and is friendly with um, uh, Robert Lee, the younger brother of Bruce Lee, because I think they're actually closer in age. Oh, right. Yeah, I think that uh, 
Bruce Lee was born in 1940 and Larry Ting was born in 1947. Mm-hmm. All right, and I think that that might have been around the time that uh, Robert was uh, uh, born. So I think that they're close in age. Oh, yeah. Right. So so there is some connection there between Larry Ting and Robert Lee, but but not uh, to, to Bruce. And, and Larry Ting is not really a big Bruce Lee fan. Man. Yeah. No no great stories there, unfortunately. Damn. Basically, I just gave a long ass response. Say no, there's no stories. <laughs> <laughs> and no yeah ah. all right so moving right along moving right along uh, next up we got Dryson oh Jesus oh dear God yeah. yes no. you know I, I now have opened the you know people can book my um, ultimate Hong Kong Kung Fu tour that's true and uh, I was surprised how many people booked the like the the platinum package. We almost Ooh. sold out of the platinum package, right? How many uh, platinum packages? I only I only had five oh. Be- because uh, the platinum package you can get one private lesson with me in Hong Kong. Ah. But that's the reason I only made five because yeah. if I'm doing a seven day tour, I don't have time to teach ten private lessons while I'm in Hong Kong. Oh, I have time to know. teach five, maybe. All right. Mm-hmm. So only so, but the other packages also include. The, I'm teaching a seminar in Hong Kong. The the gold package has all of that. It's just the platinum package basically just included one private lesson with me. So I just limited it to five just because of time. Okay. And those are almost sold up, sold out. But um, you know, we we have a bunch of people who filled out forms like looking mm-hmm. for info, and maybe they haven't signed up yet, but they did inquire. And I had a question on the. Um, inquiry page which is like well uh, is there anything in particular you want to do while you're in Hong Kong because um, even if no one gives me any suggestions I'm going to I'm going to run people through a really awesome tour of Hong Kong. Right. But sometimes people might say things like, oh, well, I want to see this or I want to see this. Yeah. And if those are things that are like close to other things that we're doing, I can like it's easy for me to make little amendments. You know, one of the things people want to see the um, uh, from Bloodsport where he was in the splits over um, yeah. over the harbor. Right. Ooh. And so we're probably going to go to the peak, which is a tourist spot. Mm-hmm. And that location is on the way to the peak. So because a couple of people asked for it, I can make a stop on the way to the peak. So th- within within reason, there are some things that I can add like amendments. Right. But one dude goes just like, I would love to come to Hong Kong. Just I just don't want to see Dryson. <laughs> man. Oh, dear. Yeah. Oh, man. dear. Oh, dear. Well, hopefully he doesn't show up. Hopefully he doesn't show uh, up. Yeah. Maybe Dre can show up. Dre's. What about Dr. Dre Eisen? Dre and Dryson are not the same person. No, no. So what about Dr. Sense? Eisen? Yeah. Dr. Eisen? You have Dryson, one word. Uh-huh. Dr. Eisen. And then I, we also, I also saw there was a Dryce on. So there are lots of people there's with a, a very on. there's a very lots of similar names. All right, so what's what's Dreisen got for me? Dreisen is uh, asking. Is asking. This sounds like a beardy asking. video. Yeah. I am uh, an expert in Bruce Lee. Hey guys, it's been a long time. Miss you all, especially Sifu. And just want to get at it real quick. <laughs> right <laughs> this way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. No. No. Please carry on. Tonight, one of my favorite boxers... Wait, when did he write this? I guess this is from earlier. (laughs) Tonight, one of my favorite boxers, Lomachenko, is fighting in MSG, Madison Square Garden, for those who don't know what that means. And it's monosodium glutamate. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's, that's, that's what. That's why he. Yeah. He, just he, in case. Yeah. He's fine. No, mom, not that MSG. No, not that. <laughs> so tonight, yeah. Anyway, let me, let me backtrack. Yeah. Back, so yeah, backtrack. My question: Did he ever practice Wing Chun? Because it seems like he knows Wing Chun more than a lot of people that claim to know Wing Chun. He right. uses the principles very well yeah. in the ring. Right. It's always embarrassing when someone who doesn't do Wing Chun applies Wing Chun so much better than the so-called Wing Chun people, right? Right. Uh, no, Lomachenko is, I would say his specialty is the footwork. You yeah. know, moving to the outside and always kind of making it very difficult for his opponent to find him. Um, he has amazing footwork. I, I don't think he did Wing Chun, but I know that he did some, I think he this, did Sambo. I think he did some yes. grappling stuff when he was younger, right? This, yeah. He actually has some grappling Great chops, videos, right? I think yeah. some kick, he can kick too or oh something like that, God. right? Yeah, no, he's really amazing. Um, I haven't watched any of his fights in a little while. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really follow boxing. Well, he hasn't fought in a little while. Yeah, I, haven't, I, I don't really follow boxing. I mean, I know okay. 
you know, Anderson Silva's fighting some YouTuber or something like that. That's tonight too. Yeah, um, I'm, oh, I'm, 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 I'm worried about that because this this kid is, is this kid's Paul not yeah, is Logan Paul. Jake, Paul Logan, okay, yeah. Which, it's either one of them. They're both terrible. Yeah, but the thing is, but <laughs> he's actually not a bad boxer. You know what I mean? And okay. he's a big kid. He's got power, or whatever. So my um, Logan. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, dude, he knocked out Tyron Woodley. Not that Tyron Woodley's a great boxer, but I mean, like, dude. People who want to talk shit, yeah, you put boxing gloves on and knock out Tyron Woodley. Shut up. Yeah. All right? Okay. Which is why it was funny to see Tyron Woodley in uh, Cobra Kai season it five. It was. It was interesting. <laughs> and there was one small short scene. Mm-hmm. Where Spoiler they, alert? Nah. No? Um, okay. Where it's like they, they have like Tyron Woodley's back there, and next to him is Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, mm. another UFC fighter, and the two of them fought twice against each other. Mm. But Stephen Wonderboy Thompson is only in this one scene next to him. You got to look in the background. Then he's not in any other scenes in the rest of the season. Ouch, that's weird. It's almost like a, it's like an Easter egg. Okay. Um, I love Anderson Silva, but he's forty-seven years old. That's all right. That's big, and uh, hey, that's my age. I know that's your age, but that's, <laughs> that's old for being in the ring, man. You yeah. know. And the thing is, I mean, I th- there's a big part of me that's like, yeah, Anderson Silva. I mean, we, if you've seen him boxing lately, he's very, very good. He's mm. still Anderson. He can he can put it together in a way where he was starting to lose it in MMA because of his age but he can somehow still is able to pull together in boxing but the last thing I want to do is see him get knocked out by this freaking kid no that would just I just I don't no. want that yeah, all right nobody so, wants that yes yeah, so I, I can't watch I can't watch but what all if, right? I quit I quit Twitter by the way what if Spider-Man yeah, just twists his ass huh what? huh Who? what what? Anderson Silva just busses Logan's oh, that would, ass that, like boom boom bam. that'd be great that'd be great but yeah. I don't know if that's gonna happen ah I don't know. Yeah, Twitter's just gotten very weird. Yeah. You know what's weird? Like, I have pretty decent following on Twitter, and I, you know, it just a couple of weeks ago, I realized, like, I was spending some time arguing with people on Twitter, and I was like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> Twitter's not a real place. <laughs> and you know what I did? I, I, yeah. I deleted my Twitter app. Mm-hmm. And you know what's so weird? I feel so much better. Whoa! And I, I wasn't you like dele- you d- what? I wasn't like an active. When did you do this? Well, I just deleted the Twitter. I mean, my Twitter account still exists, oh. but I made it. I made it private, and I just deleted the app. Okay. Uh, I so no lo- no yeah, notifications. Yeah. So happening. no. So I would I would go there once a day and just mm. just like and you scroll through and it's like whatever they call doom scrolling. Yeah. Where you're just <laughs> scrolling and you just look at like okay I would follow like some Hong Kong movie people and there'd be mm-hmm. some interesting stuff and then you would just watch like. And you would just realize that, you know, after looking at this stuff for a minute, you just feel so angry, mm. you know, just because of like the medium of Twitter is just such hot garbage. And I was like, yeah, but like I use it for whatever. But no one who's interested in classes finds me through Twitter. They use the good old normal Internet. Yeah. My Instagram is really the thing that's blowing up. And I'm like, why am I wasting time on this? Because I realized I was following what's called the the. Uh, sunk cost fallacy. Do you know the sunk, sunk cost fallacy? Sunk cost yes, indeed. Yeah. Yo, yeah. you always come with this knowledge. <laughs> well, the sunk cost fallacy is is basically the idea that I need to keep doing something because I've already invested so much time, money, whatever in it. But this is fallacious reasoning. All right. Mm. Like for example, people who uh, binge watch a TV series, and then halfway through the season, they don't really like the show anymore. They don't like the direction the show's taking. But they still But they still watch it because they go, I've already watched half of it, right? But the thing is that that is actually a fallacious argument, all right? If you watch something and halfway through you go, I don't like how this is going, Mm. just just drop it. Just stop watching it, (laughs) all right? You, you, you you, you, You have only a finite amount of time on this earth. And to just dedicate... X, uh, six more hours to watching a TV show because you already watched half of it is not actually a very smart use of your time. If mm-hmm. you're pouring money into something that's failing, get out of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, um, cut your losses, right? Because it, it just it doesn't make sense to like keep doing this kind of thing, right? So um, you got a Kenny Rogers that shit. Kenny Rogers, you got to know when to you hold. Gotta him. Know when to hold. Him. Know, know when, when to, to fold. Him. Him. All right. Know when to walk away. Know when to run. Yes. Yeah. All right. So um, I was like, well, I have like, a, you know, a few thousand followers on Twitter right. and like, you know, like a lot of the Wing Chun people follow me or whatever. So I would go there, but like I wasn't using Twitter to promote anything. Twitter is just a, a cesspool. Mm. Like uh, the way people interact with each other on Twitter is just gross. And, and it makes you want to interact in the same way when you're on there. And then so, yeah. you know, what's funny. Two weeks ago, I just deleted it. 
And I'm like, look, you never run out of problems in your life, all right? Like to think that one day you're gonna wake up with no problems is, 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 is ridiculous, because oh, you, you always have problems. It's, it's what makes up life. It's, it's, it's how you handle it. Yeah, but I mean, if you had no problems, I mean, you, you, when people get upset when they're like, oh, I gotta deal with all this stuff, it's like, can, but at what point in your life do you think you're gonna be without problems? Even when you're retired or whatever, it's like, oh, the, the flower pot in the front of my house fell yeah. and broke. It's That's your problem. But it's a, yeah, yeah, but it's like, but you, you always have something to deal with, right? Uh -huh. And I just realized like uh, getting rid of Twitter was such a, a long, like I should have done it so long ago. <laughs> Because oh, like, wow. if you want to watch news or you want to follow, like, there's so much better ways to consume that information. Twitter encourages encourages everyone on that platform to be a prick, myself included, to other people, and 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 to think about things in a way where like you think that this is a real world. It's not. Twitter is not real. It's not a real place, Damn. and you can just not be there. And you'll be so much better for it. Just All a right? place to rant. Yeah, I just, getting rid of Twitter was so great. You know what I, I love, love about though. Twitter, though? What? Now, off to you. Jimmy Kimmel has a, a thing where he has gets everyone to read celebrity out their mean tweets. tweets. Mean celebrity tweets. Yeah, man. but I mean, but. They're good. I'm sorry. Yeah, they're funny, but. but they're funny. But how, how, how long are you going to keep laughing at that stuff? At some point, it's like. I, no, it, it, yeah. it, but the problem is it encourages people to talk to each other in a way that you would never talk in face-to-face. Oh, face. true, true. And, yeah. and, and, and I think you're either, mm. you're either not part of that problem or you are that problem. And I think that by being on Twitter and engaging with people that way is just encouraging people to talk to each other in a way they wouldn't talk to each other face-to-face. -face. And I think it's a shit medium. And um, anyway... I don't yeah. want to just rant about it, but anyway. I mean, look, you know, you are missing. It's got a lot of masters of one particular style. Though. What style is this? Board keto. Board keto. Board keto. Yes. What? Yeah. Board kundo. Mm -hmm. Uh oh, wow. someone made a comment. Yeah. I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> Make my tang, mum. That's right. Jeet jeet kin donuts on there, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Keyboard warriors, a lot of them. Yeah. Ay, ay, ay. All right. So, did, was there a question? The question was about Lomachenko. Lomachenko. Beautiful. Is Next he, question. Is he is he he's great. a Wing Chun practitioner? No, come on. He's not. Get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> but he's good at Wing Chun. Along with dry soon, get out of here. Mm -hmm. How is he so good at Wing Chun, but he doesn't know Wing Chun? Is well, thing. Wing Chun is principles, and you see these principles across a number of different martial arts, right? And sometimes you don't see those principles at all by people who do Wing Chun. Yeah. Sheesh. Hey Kung Fu Genius listeners, are you a fan of Wing Chun Kung Fu? Well, if you listen to me, I assume you are. I got great news for KFG fans. Right now, you can get an all-access one-month free trial subscription to Wing Chun Illustrated Magazine. Yes, I said free. Go to WCINewsstand.com and register in the upper right-hand corner. Fill out your email and password and use the code KFG Trial to get your free trial to all the issues from 2011 to the current issue. That's right, all the issues. Even the one with this cool guy on the cover. That's me for those of you listening to us on audio. My Kung Fu Genius column is also in all the new issues as if you needed another reason to get this awesome magazine. Go get your free trial subscription today. For all that information, check out the description below. And now back to me. All right, do we have time for one more? I think we got time for one more. All right, let's bring it with my man, Luke Cap. Luke Cap in the house. Huge supporter of KFG. Yes. Luke Cap says, great episode. Awesome. Though hearing about the death kung fu movie, uh, the death of kung fu movies was a little heartbreaking, looking forward to hearing more about the Hong Kong trip. Been a place I've wanted to go since moving to China. Anyway, question for you. Do you think the Ip Man movies or Yip Man movies, or Yip Man. IP Man movies. When you speak of them in plural, you should call them Ip Men movies. Okay. Yes. Ip, Ip Men. Ip Men movies. Yeah, we're being <laughs> movies. invaded by tons of Ip Men. No! Yes. <laughs> Do you think the Ip Men movies would have been better if the Donnie Yen wasn't playing Yip Man, but an original character? Same story and everything, but he... But the character wasn't Yip Man. No, I don't think it would have changed anything hmm. because of, uh, no, I'm fine that it played Yip Man, that he played Yip Man because it brought tons of students to our schools. True, so true. That's, I'm totally this fine with that, right? Yeah. Um, look, I've always kind of complained about 
like how the stories are not really accurate, right? But look, again, they're not documentaries, they're movies, mm -hmm. okay? So as a Wing Chun practitioner, when you ask me what my opinion is on the Yip Man movies, I will go, all right, I like the fight scenes in this one, I don't like the story because it doesn't jibe with the real story. That is a unique perspective you're going to get from me because I'm a Wing Chun practitioner. Anyone else is going to be like, I love Donnie Yen. I love when he does the Wing Chun. I love the stories that I've he fought the 10 black belts. It's real good. All right? <laughs> right? It doesn't matter that none of that stuff happened. But the problem is I can't watch those movies without wearing my, like, I'm a Wing Chun Sifu hat. You see oh, what okay, I mean? Yeah. So um, that's why you're always going to get that type of criticism from me. And then you hear other people saying, well, these are just movies. They're just for entertainment. Yeah, you're totally right. But you asked me my opinion. Okay? Like, I'm not okay. telling you not to watch them. I'm not telling you not to enjoy them. I'm just telling you they're historically not accurate, which might seem like Captain Obvious. <laughs> but you're asking me from a Wing Chun perspective. And I'm also going to tell you, and the fight scenes are... Some of sometimes they're good and sometimes they're absolutely atrocious. Like mm -hmm. I think that given what you can do with Wing Chun, they can sometimes be much better. And also, Yip Man's real life story is very compelling. Um, I understand the need to sometimes fictionalize things where they don't know or just for the sake of having a better story. But like, there's a, there are a lot of story beats about Yip Man's real life. All right that would make for great movies that they just ignore while they kind of turn him into a one-dimensional superhero. But like I've mentioned before, um, the only reason Wing Chun people take exception to this is because it's, it's the first time it's happened to us. In the history of Hong Kong martial arts cinema, yeah. they have made so many films about other martial art masters who were real, but those films are highly fictionalized. Wong Fei Hong as the classic wow. example. There are more films about oh, Wong Fei Hong than about any other character, I believe, in cinema. Because uh, Quan Ta King did so many films where he played Wong Fei Hong. They were like these serial films that they just keep pumping one after the other. Okay. I think he played Wong Fei Hong over 100 times. Yes. So I think he had the um, uh, record for the actor who played the same character the most number of times in films, right? In feature length films. Um, and then on top of that, Quan Ta King was not the only person who played Wong Fei Hong. Wong Fei Hong was depicted multiple times in the 70s the by other actors. Villain. No, no, Wong Fei Hong is the good guy. He's not the Oh, villain. my bad, no, my right? bad. I'm thinking Wong Fei Hong else. is the, the, uh, the folk hero of, of Canton. He's a Hungar uh, master. Okay, I've got a quick question yeah. here because my brain is going into math mode a yes. hundred times. Yeah. Like how many movies do you... I was like, even if you made... Five feature-length movies yeah. in a year. Yeah, that's like <laughs> twenty-five years in yeah. length of playing the uh, same character. Quan Tan King started making uh, Wong Fei Hung films in the forties, and I think the last time he formally played Wong Fei Hung was seventy-three. Bloody mm. hell! Yeah. and then he 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 reprised the role two more times in cameos in Magnificent Butcher in the famous calligraphy fight scene. And then one more time in Dreadnought, where he was just, he was kind of old and it was just, it was about his students. And then they came and saw Sifu and he would be like in two scenes. But I think the last Wong Fei Hong movie was uh, The Skyhawk, which the Chinese title is Wong Fei Hong. And that was 1972, 1973. And Carter Wong from Big Trouble in Little China is in that movie. Oh, wow. A very young Carter Wong. Okay. It was a Golden Harvest film. And then bef before that, he had just, you know, he, they were just pumping those movies out one right after the other in these serials. So um, these, and they were, the original ones were black and white. I mean, he had been doing that since the 40s. Oish. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, but then, you know, Wong Fei Hung was uh, played by many other actors in the 70s and then later, but, you know, by Jet Li and, you know, even Jackie Chan. Drunken Master is about Wong Fei Hung. But when Jackie was young, they didn't want to play the old Wong Fei Hung because that was Quan Ta King's thing. Mm. So they didn't want to like step on playing the old Wong Fei Hung because Quan Ta King had so established that role. In fact, when Quan Ta King, uh, you know, while he was still quite famous for making those films, he would get into a taxi in Hong Kong and the taxi would drive him somewhere. And then when he would go to pay, the taxi driver would say, mm, Sai Beijing, like, you don't need to pay Wong Zivu. They would call him Wong Zivu. Wong Zivu. His name is Quan, yeah. Quan, like, Quan yeah. is his family name, right? Right. But they would be like, you know, mm, Sai Beijing, like, you don't need to pay wow. Wong Zivu, right? They would just call him Wong Zivu, right? So he was so kind of 
synonymous with that role that it's like great. yeah um so that's why even when they depicted Wong Fei Hung in films often not they did it occasionally but they would usually do like a middle-aged Wong Fei Hung or like a younger Wong Fei Hung and try to avoid the more elderly one that he later played uh, and then that's why when they did Drunken Master, Jackie Chan's character is Wong Fei Hong, but he's a young Wong Fei Hong, and then like he was naughty when he was younger, and then he learns drunken boxing and stuff. So, um, but Wong Fei Hong was a real person, all right. Wong Fei Hong was the a grandmaster in Hong Gar. He is like you know our good friend you know Mak Chi Kong. He yes. Wong Fei Hong is like his you know great 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 grand teacher. You know yeah. what I mean? Like he was a real dude, right? Uh, and the Hungar people, you think about all the hundreds of films that Hungar is the style. And the people who are there depicting, whether it's Lam Sai Wing or Wong Fei Hong or, or all of these guys were real people. And none of those stories are true. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, they're just like, yeah, it's just fiction, right? And then when it comes into our backyard with Yip Man, you know, we're all, you know, even myself included, oh, the story's not, because we're not used to it. I remember mm. the first time I grumbled about how inaccurate, like, Yip Man 2 was, uh, one of my Hungar friends on, like, uh, Facebook wrote, like, yeah, now you know how we feel about all those Wong Fei Hong movies, right? Okay. So, um, no, I think it's fine that he played Yip Man. I mean, Wong Fei Hong is famous, and that line of Hong Kun is so famous also because of the movies. Also because of this huge um, library of this robust catalog of films that depict this guy, even if those stories aren't true. So the fact that there are all these Yip Man movies, that just helps to bolster Yip Man and Wing Chun. And yes, you can, you can be like, well, it doesn't really tell the story accurately. And then there are people that think that, oh, they're trying to make Yip Man look too much like this. Or modern day Yip Man movies make him very nationalistic for China because you have to, even though he was not really that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I get like those concerns, but on the whole, it's kind of a, you know, it, it's a rising tide that's kind of raised all the Wing Chun ships to a certain degree, even if those films are, you know, brutally, brutally inaccurate, you know? So, um, I think it's just something we have to kind of accept. Um, I, I think I think I'm okay with it, yeah. um, even even though I think that you know it could be uh, they could definitely be better. You know, um, it's interesting to see what what, what is the what is it going to be like years from now. You know, a big reason why they they obviously went with Yip Man is because they. Um, couldn't get Bruce Lee because right. of, you know the rights and stuff, so they went to the next one. The, the, the interesting thing for me. Um, about this whole like Yip Man movie stuff was talking to, to the late Sifu Chan Chi Man about it. Because you have to imagine for Sifu Chan Chi Man, Yip Man was his Sifu. This was someone he knew in real life. Yeah. He went to his house, he went and ate with him. They, they uh, trained together. They, the, you know, the, the stories like he's holding him hand in hand with the lantern and they knew, the, you know, and he would practice with him and he would spend time with him and stuff like that. This is someone he knew. And now some 50 years later, this guy's being depicted in films by an actor. And, and so one time I remember you know, being at Sifu uh, Chan's house, I was like, what is it like for you to see a movie like Yip Man when you knew the real guy mm -hmm. and you know this story? Like, what, because you have to imagine, like, what, what if something happened like, to someone you knew who later became famous and then they made all these movies about him, but like you were his boy growing up and then you know it's not like that. It's, it would be very strange, right? Wow. And so he was just like, he says, yeah, it's very strange because he goes, that, that's, that's not the Yip Man I know. He goes, that, it's a character and it has my Sivu's name. Hmm. But he goes, but that is not Yip Man. Right. And so it was just interesting to hear him say that. Right. You know, so I thought that that was a really interesting take. And that's all I'm going to say about that. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. As always, don't forget to like this episode, subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius, hit that bell for notifications. And if you have any questions for me to answer on a future episode, put them in the comments below. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. 
word is I'm a kung fu genius Technique speaks for me, not lineage Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Si Kung And I produce masters, you surpassed us Your kung fu stiffer than corpse and caskets City Wing Chung is the house I built Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt Alex Richter, always the victor Audio recording? Yeah. All right, listen to that silky smooth voice. So, Dre, fix it, that, all right? I'm trying. But Jesus, I'm Dre. Doing some weird shit. Well, is it just drip, dropping down? Is that the problem? Yeah. Well, is that what drip? you could do, right, is you could tighten it. No, no, this would require too much skill on Dre's part. Bullshit, Mikey. Gave me some faulty shit. It's all still right, let's dropping. do it. It's yeah. still. You got to tighten it, Dre. You like having so much space above your head? Does that look good? That's in the drop zone. See, it's dropping now. It's in the drop zone. Okay. Oh, Dre, can you move forward a little bit? Because right now you... Yeah, you're like a fucking football field away from your mic. And could you put more distance between your pop filter and the mic just so that, I don't know, a fucking DC-10 could fly through there? <laughs> yeah, not actually. He was being sarcastic. Put it closer. Oh, yeah. I hate sarcasm. I never know when this. No. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, no, no, okay, no, okay. No. I'm sorry. We're going to have to do this again. You are so, like, far away. Yeah. You are ridiculously yeah, far from your mic. Look how far, look how close he is and look how far. Yeah. So, yeah. It, so, so, look, how, look how you set us up. So, use me look as how, an example. I'm sorry, closer. Andrew. Andrew, forgive me. Did we establish the banger? Oh, you're going to have to edit this out. Yeah. Did we? You mean you? Uh, Did you do your job as the guy who uh, picks the questions? Yeah, don't edit that bit out. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to need some Jeopardy music in the future. Uh, should I we just like go on. with this as a banger? I think this is a... a, a, a is there a fire somewhere? Yeah, hold on. It smells like hot dogs up in here. Oh, yeah. Burnt yes. hot dogs. It actually dogs. does smell. Yeah, well, that's because there's a street there's fair. A street fair outside. outside. There's a street fair outside. Oh, well, how are you... Oh, now I can smell it. Man, that is coming all the way up. <laughs> yeah, I know. It does smell almost like there's a fire, right? Yeah, well, I mean, to be fair, if Dre's around, that could still be just Dre. It's yes. Burn hot, burn hot dogs. dogs. We got we to gotta edit that part. Wow. Telling Andrew how to do his job. Yeah, I know, right? Freaking diva. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. As always, don't forget to... <laughs> and, it and it begins. And it begins. And it begins. All right. All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of ground fighting, you know, lots of Wing Jesus Chun. Jesus Christ, yes. Lots of Wing Chun, lots of ground fighting. Lots of Wing Chun ground fighting. You know, the style that you actually, you know, you're a Sifu in. All right, peoples. Oh, 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 oh,